Hello everyone. Welcome. I'd like to thank those that have listened to the first entry and have given me feedback and support. If there's one person out there enjoying this besides me, I can consider this a win. I would like to take a moment to say that this module from this point on is not pretty, nor does it look away on harsh subjects. With this chapter of Ulfgar's journal, I feel compelled to warn you that there will be talk of suicide and child violence. If you find this disturbing, I understand if you can't continue. For those of you that want to see the conclusion, I welcome you to the second chapter, The Exploration of the Death House. With the children relatively safe inside the tent, we followed the lass up the worn stone stairs and ease into the foyer. We crowded inside with our weapons drawn and ready for this monster the children had warned us about, but we were greeted with nothing but the large hall that had a black marble fireplace on one side and a red marble staircase on the other. The wooden paneled walls had vines and beasts carved in different scenes in the length of the room. It was a place that spoke of money and nobility. Whoever lived in this house had money, but with the disrepair that I could see at first glance, suggested that their funds were at least waning. We wasted no time to start moving up the staircase, for we believed whatever would be there in that room would be upstairs. Already feeling guilty of not protecting Othrot, I took the lead to make sure that no one else would take injury. The air was cold and thick with a layer of dust. I couldn't understand how the children could live in such a house that was unkempt. And while I ascended the stairs, I kept thinking about the children outside and wondering if they're safe, that I didn't notice the movement at the top of the stairs. By the time that I made it to the top, it was too late. Something dark moved fast and ruthlessly. A figure in black plate armor attacked and shoved me over the banister and I fell to the floor. Although my chainmail took some of the blow, I felt the weave wind leave my lungs while the rest of the party started attacking. While I tried to collect myself and rushed to my friends to help, Gunner, knowing not my fate, had grappled the figure and hurled it over the balcony in rage. I barely moved out of the way in time for the figure to crash to the ground. The noise of metal hitting the marble floor sounded through the empty hall, and to my surprise, the pieces of armor broke away, revealing nothing inside. What could have possessed the armor to act on its own? What kind of magic was work in this house? And was it evil? Was it good? These were the questions that we discussed when inspecting the black armor. Othorot held up the helm of his own face and we noticed the shape was formed into the snarling of wolf, which resembled his own face. The lass and Cassius didn't seem too worried, and he assured us that whatever was at work, it was neither good nor evil. Though I could not accept his statement, I knew that I couldn't talk to him about it anymore. He does not think as a cleric does, he thinks as a man of science. We went back up to the staircase, and came to a room with two oil lamps. The cobwebs burned away when Othrot used his magic to light them, and the dark room was filled with a dull yellow glow revealing a room with ornate wooden walls and a bookshelf that held the remains of what used to be expensive thick tomes. All that remained now were flimsy leather spines or crumbled up pages, and while we were taking a moment to recover from the attack from this magical armor, Cassius was admiring the workmanship on the walls when he discovered that part of the wall could be pushed in. With a click, it swung open to reveal a narrow hall. Though I had been accustomed to narrow passageways all my life as a dwarf, this had been designed with taller, skinnier folk in mind. We found ourselves in a room with a bed. Beside it was a large window that had been yellowed with grime and dust. The weak light that came through did nothing to reveal much of the room, but we could see, beside the window with the frayed curtains, a bassinet. And then there was a voice. Can you please save my Walter? A woman said, facing away from us on the bed. She had come out of nowhere, and none of us felt comfortable enough to get closer. Gunnar apologized for intruding, and the moment he took a step forward, the woman was simply just gone. I could feel my skin begin to tingle, because it was obvious then that there were unnatural forces at the work in this house. 
I do not know what possessed Lass, our monk, to go to the bassinet, but we watched in horror as she walked over and peeked in. She bent over and she raised. when she raised back up, she was holding a wrapped bundle in her hands. There was a single cry and the woman's face appeared between the Lass and the bundle and she shouted, Don't wake the baby! The bundle went empty. We shouted and pulled our weapons ready to fight this specter, but she did not reveal herself again. It was just an empty nursery. With the secret door to this bedroom, it suggested that there was something more going on to this house than just a simple monster. Othrod announced he didn't think we needed to spend much more time in this place, and Cassius seconded his opinion. The rest of us knew that there was something amiss in the house, and that the children outside needed to be ensured that whatever happened could and would be stopped. I made a silent vow to make sure that this woman and her child, whatever or whoever this Walter was, would be laid to rest. <clears throat> we left the room with worry and a heavy heart. There was a hallway with closed doors and we checked each of them. One of them seemed to be a guest room with a collapsed bed and a set of drawers. The next room we opened to find a dark room with two beds beside one another. Across the floor was dull gray shapes, and Gunnar bent to expect them and stood up with ruined remains of a stuffed bear. The more we looked, the more we realized that the shapes on the floor were toys. There was a window, but to our horror it had been bricked up. There were cracks here and there where the outside cold pushed in. The beds, Cassia had whispered. We looked in line on each of the beds were a set of children's bones. There was no greater evil than those that lay harm upon children. I could feel a deep sorrow and worry fill my soul as I tried to imagine that what they had been through. We did our best to arrange them respectfully, and then I knelt between them and said a prayer. Maradon, the old father, the blacksmith of life, allow these poor souls to find the welcoming warmth of your forge. I can't say that I've ever had a close relationship with Maradon, but when I invoked his name in prayer before, I'd always felt something, a warmth that came from the center of my chest when I used my powers to cast spells or pray. But as I spoke the words, I felt nothing, just an empty void, a silence that I found unsettling, that for the first time in a long time caused fear to creep in my bones. I did not share this with my companions because I didn't want to cause panic, and secondly, I knew none of them shared the belief in the gods that I did, so they would not feel it as I did. It was after that moment of silence that behind us, Rose and Thorn appeared. They asked us why they were in, we were in their room. We shared a sad, shock look with one another. Though we all known it in the back of our minds, we had chosen not to believe that these children had been dead for a very long time. We spoke with them at great length and found that they had been locked in their room and starved to death. Though they still believed themselves to be alive and talked of being hungry and scared of the monster. Not knowing what to do, we took a moment's rest in the room to heal our wounds before we traveled on. It was during this time that we became close with the two children and they agreed to accompany us as we traveled through the house in search of this monster. Since we were in the attic, I checked another room that looked like another bedroom. <clears throat> This one had a chest that had been locked tight, and we forced the lock and found wrapped inside women's clothes that had a set of bones underneath. Last looked over the clothes and said it looked like the same dress as the specter downstairs was wearing. I laid the bones out on the bed, and through my rudimentary knowledge with the help of Cassius's learned background, we were able to find that she had been pregnant. The children didn't seem to take notice of the bones, but they told us that Margaret was their nursemaid, and she lived in this room when they were not, when she wasn't taking care of them. They said that she was in fact a very nice woman, and although I felt nothing before, I said another prayer to Moradon to lay this woman to rest. No matter if we fill our gods or not, we still have to keep praying. With nothing left for us to discover, we carefully went down the rickety stairs covered with dust and back into the second floor landing. We found a set of double doors that Rose informed was their parents' room. She had looked away and told us that she would not follow us in there. And when we pressed, she said that it made her feel... bad. What could make a ghost feel fear, I wondered. But we pressed on and opened the thick wooden double doors. We didn't notice the holy burgundy drapes, or the worn tiger skin, or the portrait of the owners of this manor, Gustav, 
and Elizabeth Durst. Everything in the room spoke of wealth and nobility, but we could not take our eyes away from the body that was hanging from a rope that was attached to the beam of the four-poster bed. He was dressed in dark clothes that were all made of silks, and looking at his sunken face and comparing it to that of the portrait, portrait we had deduced, deduced that it was in fact Gustav. The lass and I cut the body down as respectfully as we could and laid them out on top of the bed. There were some folks that believed that suicide would damn a soul and that a person's deeds in their life should be ignored. But I think sometimes we get in those dark places where we can't see the light. That some of us believe that death is the only answer. It is a brave thing to adventure across the threshold of death no matter how it comes. But I speak to you, dear reader. That there are other ways of overcoming things that, than death. We were given a spark of fire to survive, even in those darkest moments. It isn't going to be some deity that's going to save you. It's going to require you to fight against the inevitable and a primal want to continue. We were made to stand against such odds, and since the dawn of our existence we have persevered. Gustav had a letter in his breast pocket, written in his own hand that explained why he had taken his own life. Cassius unfolded the letter and stood at the windows that had windmill designs into the frame and read it aloud, while we stood around the body taking, out the, taking in the words and looking at the remains of what once was a man. In the letter it talks about his wife, Elizabeth Durst, having an unnamed disease. As he read on, we learned that Gustav was distraught over his wife's change of behavior and feared for the lives of his own children. During that time, he fell in love with a nursemaid, Margaret and they had a child together. He refers to his wife as a fiend further in the letter and talks about how Margaret had disappeared, that he believed that his wife was the killer. We left the room untouched as much as we could and closed the doors, which we noticed had windmills carved into them as well. Rose and Thorn appeared again and we followed them down to the library. The books were in ruins and I found no interest in being there. The thought that this woman named Elizabeth had killed a woman and maybe even Walter worried me. So I was surprised when Cassius shouted for us to come to him. He, with his keen eyes, had found another secret door that led into a narrow room with a black marble bookshelves. Again, the children did not follow. In this room, there were only three bookshelves with a chest and a skeleton lying against the farthest wall. These books we found had survived. Each one of them were bound in black leather Gunner and Otherot, being well read, opened the books, and they found horrible rituals that required parts of human and children that ultimately would summon a fiend. This room was a place of unholy evil. We did find a letter within the room, folded up and sticking out of one of the books. The author's penmanship was large and elegant. The lass read it to us, and as she found it, it turned out that the writer had called the group here, the priests of O, as nothing but worms beneath their feet. The author had filled the entire two pages with insults that denied their request for an audience. It was signed by a person that they called themselves Strahd von Zarovich. Within the chest, the party found three black bank blank books, a magical scroll that held some sort of spell that I left for the wizards, and a deed to a windmill that claimed it was to the east of a place called Volaki. I cannot take another minute in the room. So we left and followed the children on down the hall to another set of massive double doors. This room was large, and though the wood on the floor had warped and the tall curtains had fallen and been thrown across the room, I could imagine it as an exquisite ballroom once where the Durst danced happily together while their friends and children watched happily. The amount of sorrow that filled my heart knowing that all happiness had been drained from this place was overwhelming. That's when we saw movement from the other side of the room and we drew our weapons once again, ready to see what foul beast came forth. We were surprised to see a shaggy grey dog move toward us with its tail tucked between its legs. We don't know how it got there, but I didn't care. I fed it some dry meat and found a leather collar that states that the dog's name was Lancelot of Barovia. This was the first time we had proof we were near our destination. I patted the dog and fed him some more dried meat until he was happily running between the party's legs. 
I even caught Cassius, who seemed cold to certain things like this, smile at the dog, if it was only slightly. With nothing left on the second floor, we went downstairs and stepped into a massive dining hall with plates full of rotten food sitting on tables. There was talking and laughter, but there was only us visible in the room. Othroth mentioned something about the echoes of the past, and I don't know much about how ghosts or specters work. I do know that sometimes things happen in certain places that leave a lasting effect. I hoped, as we left for the room, that the things that happened in this room were good. The last room we hadn't visited was at the far end of the house that Rose called the Trophy Room. It had two large wolves, bigger than anything I'd ever seen, posed as if they were in the middle of attacking. But other than that, there was nothing left. That's when Rose informed us that she only knew of one other door in the house, but she had never been through because it was scary. We followed her small, ghostly form back to the attic, to the closet where Margaret's room. There was a door leading down a spiral set of stairs. We turned to ask Rose what was down there, but she was gone and would not answer our calls. Cold air came up to us and Lancelot whimpered at my side. We have no other choice, I said. We could leave, Cassius replied. Maybe, if I would have listened to him and left the house, we wouldn't have to endure what was waiting below us. The things down there in the dark bowels of the Durst Manor were hungry, for they had been trapped with their hunger for living flesh for uncountable years. I wish I could say that Elizabeth Durst was happy to see us. But that's for next time. Moradon keep you until then.